This is the first video for chapter 16, which is going to be the, our last chapter of the semester. And we're still focusing on advertising and especially the question of whether there's too much or too little advertising and what, if anything, uh, we should do about it. So the question of whether or not advertising is good or bad is an important one because uh, for most of us, you know, we see a lot of advertising, right? We see advertising uh, on TV, on the internet, uh, in the movie theaters, um, where almost wherever we go, uh, we see advertising. And we saw in the last chapter that the advertising to sales ratio exceeds 10% for most, uh, or at least for a lot of consumer goods. Um, and we've been talking about, you know, advertising, you know, for a long time. Um, H.G. Wells uh, said that advertising is legalized lying back in 1934. Um, and so we'll talk about some of the, the problems with advertising and uh, both in terms of, you know, deceitful or stereotypical advertising, but also just whether there's too much. Um, and on the other hand, right, we want to think about, OK, well, if there's if most advertising is informative, then that's probably a good thing. Um, and so we want to think about, you know, the positives of advertising along with the negatives. So if we think about advertising. Um, Going back to, you know, 1914 and the Federal Trade Commission Act, um, we've had, you know, sort of three conditions that the FTC says have to be met for an ad uh, to be considered false or deceptive, which uh, is illegal according to that act. So uh, first, the ad must either present or omit information that is likely to mislead consumers. So they have to either be saying something um, that is misleading or leaving out information um, that could then end up being misleading. Second, the ad must be viewed as deceptive from the viewpoint of a reasonable consumer. So um, or the targeted group. And so this is important for advertising, you know, that targets children. Um, so the idea is, you know, if you show a car flying, um, at which I have seen, I think it was a Hyundai commercial. Uh, a reasonable commercial, uh, a reasonable consumer will know that that's uh, not true. But if you show a toy flying to children that doesn't actually fly, um, then that might be deceptive because the children might actually believe that it does fly. Um, and then the third condition that must be met for an ad to be false or deceptive is materiality. And so uh, this means that it must be um, important enough to have caused consumers to make a different choice. So like if if you show this toy flying and it doesn't fly, but it didn't lead to any more people, you know, buying it, then uh, it fails the materiality act. But if it does lead to a lot more people buying that toy, then um, then that condition is met. So all three of those have to be met uh, for an ad to actually be illegal. And of course, most um, most ads that we see uh, obviously are not illegal, and and they have a you know lawyers looking at them to make sure that they uh, don't meet these three conditions. So the conservative argument in terms of regulation um, is posed by uh, Posner in, back in 1973. And he basically says, you know, we don't need to regulate advertisement because if you make false claims, um, then consumers will punish you uh, in the future, right? You're not going to get uh, future sales. Nagler, on the other hand, says that, well, that, that depends on the type of product, right? If you say, you know, this type of food tastes really good and it tastes terrible, then yeah, you're not going to uh, get a lot of repeat sales. But a lot of products aren't like that. And so especially as products become more complex um, and especially for like experience good or credence goods, uh, that might not be true. And, and another thing is, is that people don't like to admit they were wrong. So if people buy things, um, they're actually more willing to say that it was good uh, than if they hadn't bought it um, because they don't like to admit that they're wrong. Um, another couple factors that sort of influence firms incentive to engage in false or, or deceptive advertising. One is that if they're going out of business, um, they might be more willing to do that because they have less to lose, right? So, I mean, what's the worst that happens? They're going out of business anyway. Um, and then obviously we said with credence goods or experience goods, you, you won't be able to tell false claims uh, as easily. And so um, firms might be more willing to, to make those false claims. Um, 
We also want to think about sort of social boundaries. Um, sort of a lot of advertisement these days um, is all about, you know, um, providing good looking people, having a great time. Um, the, the book talks about, you know, the fact it wasn't really until 1911 that we had a uh, sort of the first uh, sex appeal ad for Woodbury soap. Um, also, we have problems in ads with stereotypes. Um, I think people are much more sensitive to that these days than they used to be. Um, and so if you, there are commercials that come out that promote sexism, racism, or ageism, uh, people are more likely to get, firms are more likely to get called on it than they used to be. Um, but it's still, you know, not that uncommon. And of course, you know, sexism and racism were, were much more common uh, in, you know, the 50s, 60s, 70s, uh, 80s um, than they are now. So one question then is, all right, well, if we're thinking about regulation, we want to think about efficiency. Um, and so let's assume that advertisements are, are truthful and, and they're not full of stereotypes. We could still have too much um, advertising from sort of an efficiency point of view, um, especially for that type of efficient for that type of advertising that's you know persuasive or image uh, enhancing. The problem, of course, uh, which Dixit and Norman pointed out, is that if advertising <laughs> changes consumer tastes, then what utility function are we even thinking about? Uh, using to measure welfare, right? If if you tell me this uh, soda tastes great and I believe you, but I wouldn't have thought it tasted great um, before I saw the advertisement, which, you know, how should we even measure that? Uh, so I think that's one of the most important things to think about with advertising. Um, and then there's all these, you know, issues with externalities, right? So if advertising generates positive externalities, such as providing us with, you know, free TV and radio, that's great. Um, if it provides negative externalities, such as encouraging alcohol abuse, then that's a problem. We have to think about both of those things. So we'll talk about some of that uh, in this chapter. So the first thing we want to do is just think about it sort of from a static point of view with the demand shifting level of advertising and think about whether that leads to uh, higher total surplus or less total surplus. And so we'll look at the figure in a minute. But the idea is just in this very simple model is we go from zero advertising to some profit maximizing level of advertising um, and we get end up with a higher price. Now, the interesting thing is that when we shift the demand curve from D0 to D1, we actually end up with more consumer surplus, right? This, um, I don't even know what shape that is, but whatever that shape is, A is new surplus, right? And so the consumer loses surplus C, but they still have surplus B. Um, and so we have to figure out, all right, well, do we have more surplus or less surplus? Um, the idea is that in terms of producer surplus, the change in producer surplus or profit uh, associated with a small change in advertising equals zero. So we want to focus on the change in consumer surplus. So we get A, we lose C, right? That becomes producer surplus, but they also have to pay for the, the advertising. And, um, and then we get F. Um, and so the question then is, all right, well, is that more or less? And, and it really depends on, on the shape. And so that this F is, is up here, this little tiny triangle. Um, and that really depends on the relative size of A, C, and F. But for the most part, um, it will it'll be positive as long as C is not too large relative to A and F. Um, now, this is for when advertising is like a quality improvement, right? So it's like, all right, well, we know more about this product. Um, and so we're actually that consumer surplus changes is reasonable. That may not be the case, right? As we said, you know, if, if the advertising itself changes uh, your utility function, then should we be using D0 to measure uh, utility? And then this A is just superfluous or should we be using D1 because people did in fact buy it? Um, and there's not a clear answer to that question. 